pro-cannabis media programming and PCM-TV is supported by Revolutionary Clinics, Massachusetts' number one medical dispensary where the patient comes first. And by Salient Systems for Video Surveillance. You've got regulations, Salient has solutions for your security needs. And by Accounting Buds, your number one CPA specialist for the cannabis industry. And by Artery Pay, easy, cheap, fun, and legal, just like cannabis should be. And thanks for sticking with us, folks. We're back for the final segment of this Friday's Green Rush Show. We're trying to do a deep dive, all puns intended, into the beverage market so we can understand what's going on, what some of the challenges are, and what it actually takes to be successful as a cannabis beverage entrepreneur. For this segment, Aaron is staying with us, Jason's with us, and we're joined by Lewis Goldstein, the Chief Marketing Officer of INSA. Lewis, do you have your camera running? I'm trying, okay. uh, but it seems when I disconnected from the uh, docking station at work, it doesn't connect the camera back up. So give me a sec. All right, well, we'll do that. We're going to start to jump into it. A um, little bit more discussion. So we, we would, um, Jason, how many brands do you think that a single market like Massachusetts would be able to support? Yeah, without federal legalization, if we're just talking about Massachusetts specific, again, that's just what I know yep. best. Yep. Um, we're looking at, I mean, so I look at it from the from the craft brewer perspective, you know, and I know Hasasaka, Aaron, you're obviously in wine, but like when you th think of from the craft brewer perspective, how many craft brewers are in Massachusetts? If the rules were loosened up enough that we had that many stores, you know, there's simple math you can kind of do with this, right? It's like how many, how many package stores are there? How many craft breweries are there? We're talking, you know, at some point in the, maybe in 2023, I kind of agree with Aaron, like the growth of this, we're probably going to see 20 seltzer, not 20 seltzers, 20 beverages, sorry, in the market by 2023. Um, but there's room for us all. I mean, there's an appetite for it today, but it's only going to grow. I think I just would actually want to add on to that. Where I really see the bottleneck for the number of brands is what you're talking about, about manufacturing. Um, you know, in California, just this is a parallel example, and you're still going to see this in Massachusetts too. What really limited the number of brands that could be on the market was who had manufacturing that was capable of even producing a beverage. And then as soon as you had anyone who was doing a co-packing facility come online or willing to do that, that really exploded the number that was out there. All of a sudden you go overnight from three to, you know, 15 within a year and continuing to go up from there. Yeah, and we, we you know, we always track, uh, trail a little bit behind California. We used to trail a lot, but we've kind of caught up a little bit through, you know, all this advanced innovation that's coming through. But uh, yeah, when you get something like a big, like space station coming online, and all of a sudden you've got like 20 more brands show up. Um, yeah, it's huge. And I know a few of the, uh, I, I, I've, I've looked at a few of the different co-packers in uh, California and I'm trying to get them to Massachusetts because it's expensive to do it yourself. You know, from, oh, yeah. you know, I just said it's one point to $1.4 million at the end of the day is probably what we're going to do. And we're bootstrapped. And so that's, that hurts. Um, so, yeah, but I feel like it's, it's a limit of, it's a limit on the manufacturing, but it's a limit on the regulations. I mean, it's just, everything is just so limited. Like you can't do, you have to, dot your I's, cross your T's at every little step. And, you know, a lot of it's about diversion, which is kind of like that old scare tactic, right? It's like, we can't have it in the kids' hands and stuff like that. Like, nobody's giving your kids weed. You know what I mean? Like, no, like who's doing that? Um, anyways, I can go on about that stuff. But it's just these, the, you know, the regulatory side, we're going to get smarter eventually in Massachusetts, and they're going to be more permissible, but it takes time, like anything. And so it's a long-term play for us, and it's a long-term play for anybody who's serious in the market. So what do you think about, I believe the company named Jason is Wink, the company that, it, that will come, that's coming into the state and they will produce, you, you come up with your recipe and as long as you got the license, they bring in a, a canning operation in an 18 wheeler and they produce your product for you, then they leave. That is a tricky situation. So we, we've internally analyzed that a little bit. Um, we don't know where that falls on the regulatory side. I know that there, you know, it's a is an interesting play. 
a canning line going, I don't know where, where, where does the, 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 the THC cross outside of the facility come back in? Like it's like this, it just gets really, really hairy. Right. So whatever they're doing, apparently the compliance team, whoever approved all that stuff said it was good on above board. And so we're not going to question any of that moving forward. Um, however, since it's not really like if you're trying to establish a brand in Massachusetts, I feel like you have to be a Massachusetts brand. And so if you're taking 18 wheeler into Massachusetts one day and then driving to say, you know, Illinois or, uh, you know, some other legal state, you're eventually like, are you providing enough marketing support in Massachusetts? Like for the dispensaries who are trying to get people into their dispensaries and their retail locations, are you providing that? value add of marketing and branding to get people into the store to buy this stuff. That's where I really question it. And so if they're providing all of that support, um, we actually did just see them in a, at the cannabis wedding expo that happened over the weekend. So they mm -hmm. are providing some support there, but you know, it's a tricky situation to be in. And I think a lot of people are trying to take advantage of the hype that's coming up right now. And some people are doing it successfully and some people just can't scale. Right. So we're in the business of scaling and that's our biggest thing right now. And so we'll be by scale, the number two after like a, a month after we launch, um, cause we're going to have almost the same amount of capacity on day one as uh Levia. Well, uh, just to add in about the mobile canning and sort of the co-packers coming in the state, you know, we've explored the mobile canning and, uh, it sounds like a fantastic idea, uh, but, you know, just as was mentioned, how are you going to get that on your property? How are you going to get the right loading docks? How are you going to unload all of that stuff? And actually the cost of mobile canning really doesn't make it that advantageous for a long-term large beverage operation. Um, and so. I think it is a potentially a way for some small production to start off, but for any volume, a mobile canning, I, I don't think is going to be the answer. And the large co-packers coming into the state, um, you know, it's really going to take someone uh, who's going to invest a lot of money and potentially not see the returns. Um, very early on. So I've, I've talked to some co-packers that do a lot of the beverages for uh, the alcoholic companies, the sparkling beverages, and they're starting to, for the first time, get into it in California. But, you know, they're using a facility that's making the majority of their money off of, you know, sparkling beverages from the large brewers. So, uh, I still think there's a number of years where it's going to be uh, licensees in states like Massachusetts that decide to make an investment in beverages and whether they decide to do co-packing or not, um, you know, uh, will determine whether other smaller plays can get in. But it's it's still a startup mode and I don't see it coming out of that for three to five years. And, and I guess federal decriminalization may change that, but the bigger brewers, they're not going to immediately know how to get into cannabis uh, production. They're not going to have a license. Um, and they're not going to understand the distribution system because it doesn't fit with their current three tier distribution system. So it's not going to be a slam dunk for Budweiser or Boston Beer or whoever the minute there's federal decriminalization to figure out how to market THC beverages. They're going to be uh, they're going to be trying to figure it out themselves. So, Lewis, um, now that you got your video up, let's take a quick moment. Tell us about your your role at INSA and 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 tell us about the company. So uh, sorry for the camera troubles. I should have followed your instructions. Right. Tried to get on ten minutes early, but uh, I'm a no rule worries. breaker, I guess, or something. Uh, so uh, I'm the CMO at Insa, and we're uh, a multi-state operator that's vertically integrated in Massachusetts, uh, in Pennsylvania. We cultivate and have a lab, uh, but don't own retail. And in Florida. 
We're building out our vertically integrated operations as we speak and we'll launch uh, next year. And my background has been in beverages starting at Sam Adams uh, when they were very small and the only people were Sam Adams, Anchor Steam and Sierra Nevada. And then working for Dark Pepper Snapple Group and then Organic Valley um, and a whole different kind of beverages. Uh, so we are um, growing in mass and, uh, you know, we're selling some of the better beverages we have in the state of Mass now and seeing a lot of uh, really good traction and repeat purchase and interest in those beverages. Um, but there are some good ones and there are some that really taste horrible. Um, and some of those are from the same company. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and it's really just now sparkling beverages. So, Again, if you look at the beverage, uh, if you look at how craft brews grew up, uh, you know, they each had a few, they had a few lagers, a few ales, and then they started to do some seeds. And then it exploded over a period. No one ever expected it to be like, uh, I think in the cannabis beverage space, I think there is a huge demand for people to have THC and CBD in formats that are more acceptable to our culture as cannabis begins to be destigmatized. It's not okay to bring uh, cannabis in a flower format or uh, in some other formats to a pool party um, where there are kids or even where there aren't kids yet. So a beverage is gonna be a great option and is a great option, but we're only at the infancy of the formats, the taste profiles, and the consistency of product that consumers will demand. How many, um, how many beverage manufacturers or beverage brands in Massachusetts are you dealing with right now or stocking? We're stocking three, and okay. there are probably a total of seven or eight. Um, and those three are. Uh, let's just say, you know, from my days working for Sam Adams, I feel like when I was at Sam Adams, I was much more focused on the customer um, than I feel like the current um, cannabis beverages uh, are uh, acting in a way that I think is a short term strategy. Uh, as opposed to a long-term strategy, if that makes sense. But that's this business. makes sense to me, Lewis. Hundred percent makes sense to me. I'm on the same page with that one. It is really hard to balance. Just to counter that briefly, it's really hard to balance that when you're. When we were just talking about this, Aaron. It's a long-term play. If you're going to be in this for a long time, you got to plan for a long term here. It's hard because since it takes a year plus 18 months in some cases, just to get your brand in market. Like you're constantly chomping at the bit being like, okay, am I going to do all this brand development? Like uh, 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 all the stuff we're doing and we've done, you know, that is leading up to the success that we hope we're going to have at launch. A lot of companies are doing the short term, like let's get it out there and people are going to buy it. That's the same fallacy that people fell into when it came to the large MSOs that were coming in and just growing as much as possible and saying like, people were just going to buy it. So let's just keep on growing as much as possible. And then it cut back on all the production or on the, on, on the cultivation and take losses. Right. And so I'm not going to speak too much about the public markets, et cetera, et cetera. But like, it is really hard to balance moving really, really fast, like a rocket ship to try to get to launch because there's other brands popping up all the time now, especially in the Massachusetts market versus really going through communication guidelines, brand guidelines, and really developing a full uh, concept of what it really is. Um, although we've done a lot of that work and I've got a really great team that's done a lot of this and have, has relied on people that have worked on Sam Adams products and stuff like that in the past. And we were trying to poach the best of the best. At the same time, you have to balance that with moving super fast in a bootstrapped seven person company. Yeah, there will be, what the way I look at it is, there are the brands that are looking to get in and make money and those brands it will not be long term then there are brands 
maybe there will people that will get into beverages that aren't just looking to sell their company in 12 months um, and who are trying to build a business and be in it for five, 10, 15 years and do uh, what that takes with relationship building, with supporting the customer. Um, but right now, it, people are like getting in, trying to build a distribution, not giving any discounts, not giving much support. And uh, that to me, from my standpoint, is an opportunity for uh, organizations to get in and build a long-term brand and a long-term relationship um, because those other brands will fall off, uh, in my opinion. Can I ask just because, so one of the really interesting struggles we see when you were talking about, you know, trying to serve the customer, right? Um, I'm very curious how this is in Massachusetts because over here in California, we have this sort of tug and pull between are you trying to sell to the majority of customers now where what a lot of people seem to be looking for are higher dose beverages. Um, they won't buy something that's under 10 milligrams a can and some of the most popular stuff is actually 100 milligrams a unit. You know, if I drank an entire one of those, I would be floored for probably one or two days and not showing up to work at all. Um, some people can do that and that's wonderful. But then I've got these new consumers who are having cannabis again for the first time in 20 years, or maybe the first time ever. And where they seem to do really well, at least if they can get to them and try them, is those microdose beverages, you know, where you're only having two right. and a half milligrams right. or something. All I, are you guys seeing the same thing over there? I think uh, we're seeing, well, five milligrams is the most you can have for rec, rec in Massachusetts. I haven't seen anyone, you can do higher dosages for medical only. No one has tried to do that yet. Um, there are some microdose beverages, uh, you know, 2.5 milligrams and some CBD and those are doing well. So um, I think there's, there's both today. Um, and to be honest with you, I don't even believe necessarily that everyone has the dosing down right and whether anyone has long-term stability testing done like we had to do in past lives. So I can't, I, I'm not totally sure that there is the QA behind some of the beverages out there that the dosing is truly um, uh, right if the product just sat on the shelf for two or three months or four months or whatever. So uh, I think we have a lot of room to grow even to um, build consumer trust that what they're getting is what they think they're getting. But that's, that's part of a growing industry as well. Well, that's super but, important. But I've also personally found, I guess, like one of the biggest threats I see to this entire category is a bad consumer experience on that first trial because that's something I think can slow this down another five years easily. Um, where to me, it's more probably that experience of getting too high that makes people scared of something and of doing it again. Yeah, I think there's, uh, I, I've, there are some people that are, have had bad experiences with, with the current uh, beverages on the market in Massachusetts. And I don't know if it's themselves, you know, but there, there are people that can handle dabbing that have had you know a levia beverage and had a horrible experience and i i it's hard for me to understand how if they can dab um that five milligrams of thc in a beverage would give them a bad um experience now there's a lot of people that had great experience with levia and we sell a lot of it so i don't want to uh disparage that but i i think there's something going on there um, if, uh, that, it's that that's happening. And I agree with you. I still think we're young enough that someone if has a bad experience, they'll try another one. Um, but it won't be forever. Louis, so, do you think, Matt, so in Massachusetts, we have, um, 
uh, rules. I think it's, I think they just, it's lifting to 110 milligrams in total per package, no more than I believe it's five or five and a half milligrams per serving. Do you think that that's going to continue to work with beverages or do beverages need to have more than five milligrams because one can is a serving um, in order to, to, to get some real traction? Well, if the idea is that beverages are meant to be like beer or um, like uh, alcoholic seltzers, then I think five milligrams is the right amount if and also in 2.5 milligrams is the right amount for people to be able to enjoy three four or five in the same way that uh you know beer uh for the most part uh you know there are some higher alcoholic beers that people can handle but they don't go to 15 or 20 percent alcohol if you want high alcohol like that you're going to drink bourbon and drink shots of tequila right. um so i think in the long term that thc beverages are going to be like beer or alcoholic seltzers in in that they're a controlled amount that where you can enjoy multiple um servings multiple cans and not be to a point where you're not able to converse with other people and, and have a good time. Uh, or, you know, may, there's may, maybe there'll be products out there like uh, malt liquor or something that some people will want. And the whole goal is to just drink a 40 and fall on the ground. But I don't think that's the, um, that's where the volume will be. I don't think that's where the uh, stronger brands will be. I think that'll be a fringe. So you think the the bulk of the market will stay with the lower levels of THC per can? I think that's where the that's where the volume in cannabis will be. It will there will be a high end person that just wants to get totally that that wants the this end of an experience. But I don't think that's where volume is in a, a market. Um, and I, I think if you look at other, uh, other products that provide a, a, um, a, you know, a, a, an effect like alcohol, beer, or liquor, um, you know, it, it's, it's moderation, enjoyment in moderation that is the volume. And on the hot, you know, it's it's a much lower amount of people that are um, using the product to, you know, get to a point of passing out. So I just, yeah, I would like to add a little bit to that because uh, if the, I'm going to say this the right way. If there wasn't a requirement on vertical integration in the medical market, I would also be in the medical market. And here's why. I constantly feel... I'm out there. I'm in places out there all the time with people who use and so, or consume, I should say. And I, there is a need for a higher dose. We're not that company today because we are on the low dose side. We're three milligrams, right? We're not trying to go to five. Again, like I said before, we're not trying to get a person on a rocket ship on the first drink. It's a sessionable experience. In fact, Lewis, before I gave up alcohol for good, I was looking for session beers. I didn't want to have a 7% beer anymore. I was like, why do I want to have one beer and then have water the rest of the night? I can't drive home after that. You know what I mean? So I was always on the lookout for session beers. And now I'm a huge fan of athletic brews. And they even know that at this point, I've I've tagged them on so many posts at this point. I love athletic brews. I love non-alcoholic beer. Uh, In fact, I use cannabis with non-alcoholic beer all the time. Uh, With that said, on the medical side, I would. And the reason why is because I get approached a lot from people who do use it for very much medical purposes, who I've supplied tons of random little, um, how do I say it, uh, treats and stuff like that to people who, who are just like looking for a specific type. And so what I'm always looking for is, and I actually just had a conversation with an oncologist three days ago, 
And they were like, we can't wait to have to tell people about your beverages because they're going to love it. And I'm like, listen, we're low dose. And if somebody really needs it for, for their cancer, I don't have that product today. But if it wasn't for the vertical integration restrictions on the medical market, I would be 100% trying to serve that market as well because cancer is something I'm super, super passionate about. And David, you know this too. I'm in the PMC every year, right? Raising money for cancer. Yep. I was there yesterday and I'm going to be there on Monday. The question I would have though is, and I agree with you on the medical side, is someone going to choose a beverage or, or our tinctures, um, you know, or, or uh, syringes, I just don't know if beverages, how big a market on the medical side, it may be something that's, that is done uh, for certain consumers. I just, I think tinctures, to be honest with you, is a, is a much more effective way and a much quicker activation for a medical consumer to get the relief they need. But, uh, you Lewis, know. I've got to say, actually, I think that is really a question of consistency in technology right now. I mean, what I've seen in my time in beverages and where this can really go is that well-made beverages can be way more consistent on the actual experience and faster onset than tinctures. But again, it's a question of how you're doing it and how you're making it and what you're using there. But the ability to you know, consistently bypass the whole path of going into your liver and things like that, and the things you can do with beverage to create just that consistent experience time over time. Right. I don't think any other category can do that. Right, right. All right, well, folks, we're, gonna, we're coming to the end of the Green Rush for this week. We're at 5.59, so before we wrap this show up, we're gonna go around real quick. Aaron, give us a plug for the Cannabis Beverage Association and tell us how people can find information about it, how they can find members if they're interested in products, and more importantly, how can they join? Please check us out at CannabisBeverageAssociation.org or feel free to just shoot me an email personally and I'm more than happy to chat with you and connect you. Uh, my email is Aaron, A-A-R-O-N at houseofsaka.com. Great, thank you. Lewis, where do they find you? Where, where does INSA have stores and where will they find the beverage cooler? Uh, INSA.com and we have stores uh, across Massachusetts as well as uh, so whether there are our own dispensaries or whether we wholesale uh, in Pennsylvania, you can find us in almost every dispensary in Pennsylvania. Uh, the beverages in Massachusetts, uh, nothing, everything's behind the counter. Uh, someday maybe it won't be, but uh, you know, you can check out our online menus. Um, we offer Levia, High Five, uh, can trip today and as the other great ones become available we'll bring them on as well great thank you no it was great to have you and jason always it's always good to connect with you you're always running around at 100 miles an hour so you're hard to catch it's like trying to chase a butterfly during the summertime but how do people how when do you think you're going to be launched and and how can consumers find your products so we are, we already have relationships. So basically we're, we're having our uh, PPLI on Tuesday. We are an MBE. So we actually do get some priority status for um, getting this done. So, you know, the, the CCC probably will take a vacation in December like they usually do. So we'll probably be uh, bottles in hand in January, February, February, February at the latest due to some delays. But uh, for the most part, you'll be able to find our beverages in about 20 stores, I believe we're launching with at this point. We're trying to keep it somewhat small. Um, the appetite is there, but the problem is we're trying to keep it really tight. So, uh, but you can find us in, the, in stores. We'll, we have a newsletter. We have a list. We've got everything. And I'm everywhere. I'm in the YouTube chat. I'm everywhere. So it doesn't matter. You'll find me. And, um, but at the same time, you can email me direct. It's just Jason at getgoodfeels.com representing the Goodfeels Cannabis Sparkling Beverage. Sounds great. Thank you to all the guests, to the ones who are here, as well as the prior panels. There's been another episode of The Green Rush. We do this every Friday, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern. Talk about the business of cannabis. Hope to see you next week. And remember, 
Even though Jimmy's not here, it's a whole new world of weed out there. Use it responsibly.